adorable teacher, adorable person, avid dog lover, coolest grandmom, passionate for sari, and she is a uh, owner of Doctors and Sari Group in the Facebook, as everyone knows her from uh, that. And her basic motto: Let's grow together with a lot of great ideas, fun, and laughter. So let's enjoy this uh, knowledge extravaganza. Uh, the screen now to you, ma'am. Ah, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'll just share, and this is yeah. Uh, simple thing. Ah, uh, basically, the learn simply. The idea is very really. We have to learn things very simply. It should not be like that. Ki baat cumbersome hai and long procedure is there. And our Jyoti Karande is over there. I think she should open the video so that she will be one of the persons with a co-anchor with Dr. Richa Narkele. Uh, today we are going to talk about the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. See, I have already, uh, this. there are algorithms and learn simply series over there and I always post about it. So I just thought that we can we have a group discussion, interactive session, and we can teach and we can learn from each other on this subject. So today is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Uh, antiphospholipid uh, antiphospholipid syndrome is basically most important treatable cause of miscarriage. If there's a is a patient with a miscarriage and if this antiphospholipid syndrome is positive, is the one of the thing that's the most important treatable cause. And it refers to the association between, number one, antiphospholipid antibodies, that is a lupus anticoagulant. Number two, anti-cardiolipin antibodies. Number three, anti-B2 B2 glycoprotein, I antibodies. And advert pregnancy outcome or the vascular thrombosis. So antibody, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome always refers with all those things. Antiphospholipid antibodies, anti-cardiolipin antibodies and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein I antibodies. Now the antibody syndrome is an autoimmune disease and characterized by the presence of maternal circulation of one or more antibodies against the membrane phospholipid, as well as one or more specific clinical syndromes. So it's very, very simple to find it out the way it is. Now it is an acquired rather than inherited condition. So that's the reason we are able to treat it such as it cannot explain the family history of the VTE, number one, two, and a significant family history of VTE should be a prompt testing to exclude if can be the inherited thrombophilias, including factor V or the five leaden mutation or prothrombin gene mutation and protein S, protein CA, and antithrombin deficiency. So make it a point very, very clear. It's not an, it's an acquired condition not inherited, but it cannot explain the family history of venous thrombo VTE. And if there is a VTE, we should know all about this. Now, how we diagnose the patient of APLAS, it required two distinct elements. Number one, in the correct clinical setting and a conformity a serologic testing. So approximately two to 4% of the healthy women will have a circulating antiphospholipid antibodies in the absence of any clinical symptoms. So it's another important point. And a routine screening for this antibodies in all pregnant women is strongly discouraged. So we should not do any, any testing to the normal, normal pregnant females. Now, how we say about the diagnosis of a plus, number one is the clinical manifestation include, number one is the recurrent pregnancy loss, which is defined as more than three, unexplained first trimester pregnancy losses or more than one unexplained second trimester pregnancy loss. Number two, unexplained thrombosis. It can be venous, arterial, cerebrovascular accident or myocardial infarction. And another clinical infestation is autoimmune thrombocytopenia where the platelet count is not more than one lakh. So if all these things are there, we should be worried about the if this patient is having antiphospholipid syndrome. Then recent consensus opinion suggests that the clinical conditions, number one, such as unexplained intrauterine growth restriction, we should go and see for the EPLA. If there is a massive placental abruption without anything, then also we should be worried about. And recurrent early onset of severe pregnancy being predicted. The pregnancy patient is having a sudden rise of blood pressure at the 16 weeks, 14 weeks, or 18 weeks on any time early, 
So we should be worried about APLA in those patients. So these are the clinical manifestations we are worried about. And then at least one of the three serological tests confirming the presence of circular circulating antiphospholipid antibodies is required to make the diagnosis of alpha. Can we cannot blame or we cannot say that this patient is having uh, antiphospholipid anti uh, this uh, APLA syndrome until and unless we are confirming in three serological tests. I'm telling you, it's very important. Moreover, the diagnosis requires the persistence of such antibodies as confirmed by two or more positive tests at least 20 weeks apart. So this is another important point. Now the lupus anticoagulant, we should have worried the an unidentified antiphospholipid antibodies that causes prolongation of phospholipid dependent coagulation. Now we need few tests in a vitro and vivo also. The test in a vivo in a vitro is a binding of the prothrombin activator complex. And what's very, very important, and examples of the tests that can confirm the presence of uh, lupus anticoagulant include number one, activated PTT test, dilute Russell Viper venom test, kaolin clotting time, and recalcification time. However, LAC in a vivo thrombosis is there, causes thrombosis, and results are reported at present or absent. No titers are given. The term LAC is a misnomer and it is not specific to the lupus that is SLE and it acts in a vivo as a precoagulant and not as a procoagulant and not as an anticoagulant. So make it a point with the difference between the two and you will find out. Now, when we suspect about the antiphospholipid syndrome, number one, how to confirm the diagnosis, there are things, two things we have to do. First, what is the correct clinical setting and what are the confirmatory serological tests? In a correct clinical testing, a correct history of recurrent pregnancy loss, unexplained venous or arterial thrombosis, autoimmune thrombocytopenia, if there is unexplained IUGR or placental abrasion or recurrent severe preeclampsia. If anything is no, the diagnosis of APLA is not be confirmed, consider the alternative diagnosis. So APLA is out if it, all the things are not there in a clinical setting. But in a clinical setting, any out of anything is yes. And confirmatory serological diagnosis will do three things, endocardiolipin antibody, lupus anticoagulant, and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein I antibodies. If the serological test comes yes, then the diagnosis of APLAs are confirmed. In all three tests, if it is no, the diagnosis of APLAs cannot be confirmed, consider for the alternative diagnosis. Now, if the diagnosis of APLA is confirmed, then how to treat it? It depends upon the clinical feature. Recurrent pregnancy loss, anticoagulant therapy during the pregnancy, no postpartum or lifelong. If there is an autoimmune thrombocytopenia, recommendation unclear, consider anticoagulation pregnancy therapy in pregnancy. If there is unexplained venous or arterial thrombosis, anticoagulation therapy during pregnancy, and six weeks postpartum considered the lifelong therapy. So it's very, very clear. Now, how to treat the patient with APLAS? Again, depending upon the clinical features, if there is a thrombosis such as stroke, pulmonary embolism, therapeutic anticoagulation is indicated with either unfractionized heparin or low molecular weight heparin. During pregnancy, followed by oral anticoagulation if needed, and postpartum because of five to 10% of the risk of this thing. So thrombosis had to all those things are there. Then in pregnancy, regular blood tests are required four hours after the administration of drug to ensure the anticoagulation is therapeutic. The PTT should be 1.5 to 2.4 normal and anti-10A activity level should be 0 0.6 to 1 point unit. What are the side effects if we have done the treatment and that the side effects can cause hemorrhage? thrombocytopenia and osteopenia and fractures, such women may need lifelong treatment. For women with a recurrent pregnancy loss, treatment should include the prophylactic, unfractionized uh, heparin, 5,000 to 10,000 units, BD, or low molecular weight heparin and oxaparin, 30 to 40 milligram subcutaneously daily. Then the daltaparin or the fragmarin is 2.5 thousand to 5 thousand units subcutaneous starting in the first trimester of pregnancy. 
Although the prophylactic dosing does not change the PTT, it will increase the NTX activity to 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 unit per this thing. However, it is not necessary to follow serial NTX activity. We don't do in our country also, and it's not needed in such patient. But the goal of the treatment is, number one, is to prevent pregnancy loss, to prevent VT, which is possible in with women with EPLA in pregnancy, even they have or had the VT in the past, and therefore anticoagulation should be administered throughout the pregnancy, typically for six to 12 weeks after the delivery. For women with autoimmune thrombocytopenia or a history of severe preeclampsia, IOGR or placental abruption, the optimal treatment is unknown and uh, it should be considered treating as far as the recurrent pregnancy loss. Postpartum anticoagulation is probably not necessary. So it's another important point. And these are the few points. And just I'm adding few things before we can discuss or finding out the thing. Now, the secret of happiness is very, very important. We are going to discuss few things and that's all. I don't want that this program should be long. It's just a tea time. We should be make it in a half an hour rather, but we have to put it for one hour. So small, simple things, not spending much time on it. And we can discuss many more things. Thank you so 